there, there's no cause for complacency and I'm glad that RDD is DD and not D. So the second D is matters in the Congo Basin, degradation. Uh, yes, deforestation in the sense uh, you have it in Indonesia or Brazil, uh, luckily so far hasn't happened in, in Central Africa. Uh, but I think in, 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 in the sense that RDD can be a scheme to encourage countries to actually, you know, really stop deforestation, then I think that that part of the world should not be forgotten, whether or not we have the second D. But luckily we have the second D, so I think it's going to be uh, important that uh, uh, the countries of the region are also brought on, on board with uh, the discussion to move towards, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse emission uh, reduction through the forestry sector interventions. The infrastructure is not is not fully there. You know, given what I've just told you, governance uh, structures are very weak. Uh, mechanism to ensure equitable benefit and distribution of benefits and what what are not there. So I think there is still a lot of work, a lot of ground to be covered to work towards that. But the countries, some of them have been included in this uh, readiness, you know, uh, plans uh, assisted by the World Bank and other institutions, as well as this, uh, you know, uh, NORAD uh, grant or proposal about the pilot uh, red uh, studies. So I think uh, we will be able to see what is happening there and what can be done to, to help them. The countries of the region are pretty much uh, uh, aware of uh, the discussions uh, happening around RED. They are, I would say they are very well organized because they have this regional body called COMIFAC, Commission de Forêt d'Afrique Centrale, that is really trying to get the countries together so they can have a, a common uh, position in Copenhagen. And obviously RED now, I can see in the last I would say the last couple of weeks, really, you know, say from uh, end of August, all of a sudden it has really gone very high on the agenda. Uh, up until then it was an issue for the technocrats in the Ministry of Environment or Forest, depending who is having uh, the forest in charge. But now I can see we have reached a level where like prime ministers and even some heads of state are beginning to be engaged. So I, I think it augurs well for the, for the years ahead and you know but there is a lot of work to be done in terms of the governance structure definitely if red is going to be uh, successful to any degree in that region the population in general if i exclude from that the elite uh, is has a, a always been very much aware of the value of the forest from an environmental perspective and a, a livelihood perspective. Because you have to remember that uh, it's a huge forest area with probably up to 100 million people who depend on, those, on, on that forest, especially from the non-timber forest product uh, point of view. So they see the ex exploitation of timber as a nuisance, to be, to be honest with you, because they see that the revenues coming from timber extraction and export is not really trickling down to the, to the level of the population. They were somehow much better off before timber ex extractions and exploitation came into being. So they value the forest more from this holistic approach, you know, the socio-economic environmental services uh, point of view than just purely the timber export. So it's just a matter of, actually for them it's like, well, this is what we have been aware all along, maybe we didn't call it red or whatever, but the forest is their habitat and they care very much about preserving the forest. And in a way I think it explains why in that part of the world we haven't seen uh, large-scale deforestation like we have in, in, uh, in, the, in the rest of the world. It's very, very exciting. I came to see for coming uh, from, uh, from the UN, where I was also involved in uh, you know, environmental issues. But in the UN, it was more like high there, 
managing processes, all these intergovernmental negotiations about environmental treaties. But after a number of years of doing that, I really needed a place where I can also get a feeling that I know what is actually happening down there on the ground. And to also be back in the research arena, even though I don't do research myself as such, or very marginally, but just to be associated with a, you know, a research community where the science is uh, uh, the major uh, you know, focus, because you know, I'm, I'm convinced that science has a lot to contribute to making the, the world a better place. So for me to come at C4 Science for better forest management, to improve livelihoods, to improve governance, to improve environmental services, it's like the ideal spot where I could be at this point in time in my life.